Hey guys, this is Down Phoenix, and today we have a new episode of what I'm playing. Today we are playing Bloodstained Ritual of the Night, which is the latest in the Bloodstained franchise, hosted by none other than Igarashi himself, the creator of Castlevania Symphony of the Night, as well as all the similar games that we have available on the DS and Game Boy Advance. Fantastic Castlevania games that basically set the new standard for that series. As many of you may know, Castlevania and Konami have been kind of in a weird state lately because of the fact that Konami really doesn't want to do much video games, and so that kind of left people like Igarashi, who were loyal Cap... or not Capcom, <laughs> Konami employees, that uh, they had to look elsewhere because... The type of games that he wanted to bring to gamers, they weren't in support of. They wanted to do something completely different, so he decided to start off his own company. And one of the things he did was he kickstarted this game called Bloodstained Ritual of Night. And probably proved to a lot of the Konami execs that, hey, you know what, people want these games. Because this is one of the most heavily funded games in Kickstarter history. Uh, at the time that it had its Kickstarter, it was the record setter, which is really impressive when you consider that these types of games were considered niche to begin with. But there is clearly an audience that really appreciates these types of games. These exploratory action adventure games where you have a lot of backtracking and you learn new abilities to kind of pick up new locations that you've seen before but you couldn't quite access. It's really a novel concept, of course. Obviously, one of the very first games to ever do anything like this, of course, is Metroid, and then Symphony of the Night, and technically previously to that, Castlevania II Simon's Quest, were amongst the first games to really popularize this theme, hence the term Metroidvania. And this game is definitely not going to disappoint you if you're a fan of these types of games. So, let's talk about Bloodstained Ritual of the Night because it's been a long time coming. Uh, this game took almost five years of development time. It took a very long time and it's had kind of a weird history behind the whole concept of it because the game switched developers' hands, it's had all kinds of controversies and everything like that but at the end of the day it did turn out to be a pretty solid game unlike say mighty number no. nine which was another game that had a great kickstarter success brought to us by someone who made games that really tailored to gamers of course and that of course was inafune bringing back the Mega Man style games. And funny enough, that's not the case with this one here. It's really interesting um, that this game does not have the flaws that Mighty Number no. 9 does, even though it does share a lot of the controversy and trouble surrounding it. So what changed? Because there was a time when this game was being developed by a mobile game studio, and that was a huge red flag. Unfortunately, they changed course and passed the torch onto WayForward, which has put out a lot of excellent games. And as you may know, of course, I recently did an episode on DuckTales Remastered, which was developed by WayForward. So they know what they're doing. And clearly they understood that they needed a studio that has a panache for making these types of games. And so that was something that they accomplished right. And it seemed like from that point forward, they were really doing a lot of good things because some of the early previews of this game had really terrible graphics, which, truth be told, some of that might have been because of the fact that the game was originally going to be on the 3DS as well as the Vita and the Wii U. None of those versions which, of course, came out. Although I think the Wii U probably would have handled this game as is just fine because it's on the Switch, you know. But anyways... I'm playing it on the Xbox One. I got the One X, of course, so it kind of makes sense for me because I get to take advantage of the 4K, the HDR, all that great stuff. You know, this is the only version of the game, at least console-wise, that you can play in 4K. 
uh, because even the PS4 Pro is locked to 1080p. Now that of course does come at a cost, which unfortunately they never fix, because this game does still have some performance issues on Xbox. For some reason, like here on this uh, Tower of Twin Dragons or whatever it's called that I'm in right now, this particular area has a lot of frame rate drops and things like that. Uh, it's not unplayable by any state of the imagination, but this is a $500 console, and this is not exactly a boundary-breaking game graphically, you know. I mean, that Gears of War 5 plays phenomenally on the Xbox One or X. There's, like, no frame rate drops whatsoever. So it is kind of odd that this game, which is nowhere near that graphical prowess, has problems running. Um... Uh, and, of course, I really suck at platforming, which that's another issue I do have to point out. Uh, the It just seems like there's a bit of a delay in the game timing, like with the button presses and things like that. Now, I don't know if that's because of the version I'm playing here. I am playing on game mode on my TV. There is some input delay. There is definitely some noticeable input delay that's caused me to miss a few jumps because I, you know, could have sworn that I hit the button, but apparently... Even though I hit the button, the game didn't register it in time, and so I would just end up falling instead. It's kind of a weird issue. I, From what I understand, the Switch version is the worst culprit of this, though. Um, so if you really want this game, you might think twice about the Switch, Switch version. Although I know some people that haven't had any trouble with that, like Xander Scullion. It may depend ultimately on how you're playing the game, of course. I would imagine if you're playing on portable mode... That you're probably better off. I would imagine that portable mode's gonna be a little more in tune with the actual screen technology and whatnot. So you're probably not gonna experience the same issues, of course. And look, look at the crappy physics, of course. So I do have some issues with this game, but it is still a really well-made game. Um, it's not gonna take a huge amount of time to play through, but it is a fair bit longer than Symphony of the Night, at least if you're accustomed to that particular game, because my first playthrough with this game probably took around 18 hours, um, and that technically was a little bit longer than it because it doesn't count for times when you die, because when you die, it does just like it did in Symphony of the Night, where it just goes the game over and you reload your save. So it doesn't actually keep track of that progress as far as the playtime from that, so it's completely lost. So. Your mileage may vary, but your end play time, unless you don't die at all through your entire adventure, is actually going to be longer than what it reports on the game. Um, now, I'm playing in New Game Plus mode. I upped the difficulty to hard. Um, normal difficulty, it's kind of interesting because at the very beginning of the game, it's actually pretty challenging, I noticed. Uh, the first couple of boss fights, I would I died multiple times on. Uh, but as I got through the game, as it started leveling up and things like that, things weren't getting as much... They weren't as challenging as they were originally. As a matter of fact, the game started to get a bit easier. Um, partly due to the fact, of course, that I was getting a lot better gear, had a lot higher levels, so I was able to take a lot more punishment. But also due to the fact that the challenge factor of the bosses didn't really change all that much, like as far as the patterns and things like that. You know, a lot of things were fairly predictable. Uh, I would say, you know, I mean, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is the difficulty curve's kind of imbalanced, you know. I think the game should have been easier at the beginning, but it should have been more difficult late in the later game, you know. It seems like that the number crunching and stats, there's just a little too much going on, of course, with that. And then, of course, same problems with Symphony of Night. Uh, when it comes to, like, all the different items and... Uh, pieces of armor and weapons and things like that you can pick up. There's a ton of stuff. In fact, I would say there's too much. There are so many types of items and weapons I didn't even really bother using. Uh, like the handguns, for example. You can get handguns in this game, and I understand they're probably pretty useful if you know what to do with them, but the damage output of the handguns seem to be really weak, and uh, I just... I didn't really see much of a point, especially whenever I was able to get the shards, which the shards are really neat. Basically, whenever you kill enemies, you get these shards, which you can use to cast magic spells and do all kinds of neat things like that um, to attack your enemies and um, really get to kind of exploit the system of the game. So that's really cool. I really enjoy that part of the system. Uh, we, of course, also have a hub area, which I'm going to right now. The hub area is great if you want to go back and, you know, get some quests done, you want to, you know, 
craft new items, prepare new food, you know, sell and buy items, all that good stuff. You know, it's a great place to kind of get some respite from the action of the game and kind of regear and regroup, essentially, you know, especially if you're getting your butt kicked, you can come back here, uh, see what you can do to, you know, maybe beef up your character a little more and move on. Uh, it's a really cool little spot to have, something we didn't really have in Symphony of the Night where all those places were just kind of spread out through the map, but you have like one central area which you can easily get to to do all that. And there are a couple of other NPCs that aren't in the hub area that you can, of course, interact with and do various things with. And as a matter of fact, there is a nice little cameo from a character that does seem to be pretty familiar for fans of the Castlevania series. Um, but anyways, I digress. Uh, so, I didn't really see much of a point with certain things, of course, like the handguns and things like that. There just wasn't a lot of point in using those items, so I didn't really use them after the very beginning of the game. And there was just a ton of pieces of armor and weapons that I never even bothered equipping. You know, I didn't see any point because by the time I got those pieces, I already had something that was better. And since the game is so heavily focused on stats, you know, obviously it doesn't make a lot of sense to use items and weapons that aren't as good as what you already have. It just doesn't make a lot of sense, you know, honestly. So uh, I think they should have, I don't know, it's, I think they should have more focused more on quality rather than quantity of items and weapons. I would have liked to see a greater variety of types of weapons, for example, uh, that uh, would kind of function a bit differently from each other you know I, I guess I don't know I guess I'm trying to think of this game in a 2019 focus when it's clearly being made for people that really enjoyed games from the late 90s which I do I mean Symphony of the Night is fantastic it's a fantastic phenomenal game don't get me wrong I just kind of wish that the formula evolved more uh, with this particular game uh, that being said, you know, I still enjoyed my time with this game. I'm playing through the New Game Plus after all, you know, I really have enjoyed it. As a matter of fact, New Game Plus has almost been more fun for me than playing through the main game. Partly because I'm able to just mow down these guys with some extra challenge, of course, mind you. But I'm able to go through things a lot quicker because I know what I'm doing, what I need to do to kind of accomplish things in the story, not getting stuck having to look up walkthroughs and things like that, which I haven't had to do a whole lot of, but I have had to do it a couple of times because even by Symphony of the Night standards, there are a few things that are really cryptic in this game. It is not at all very easy to accomplish uh, the main objective, and part of that problem is the fact with I mentioned with the shards. The shards give you all kinds of cool little abilities that you can use to fight enemies and buff up your character and things like that, which is really cool. But there is one particular shard which you have to unlock if you want the true ending of the game. And that shard is only unlocked by random fights with a particular enemy in one section of the game. And it's just really cryptic and, you know, it doesn't make a lot of sense that you have to just randomly grind a particular enemy until it decides to drop that shard. I probably killed about that, that enemy 20 times some of that was my fault, of course, because I didn't really understand that you needed more luck, obviously, in order to improve the chances of your drop. Once I understood that, of course, I started really going hard and equipping uh, items that increase the luck so that I can get items a lot quicker, get the shards a lot quicker, and so on. So I didn't have to spend nearly as much time grinding uh, unnecessarily, you know. And that was kind of annoying, you know. I think when it comes to items that you need to actually progress in the story... Those need to be unlocked in an organic way. They need to be unlocked through cutscenes or through locations that you get to in order to progress through the game. That kind of stuff. That is what would make sense. But the way they did that is just completely lame. <laughs> I don't want to spoil it for you guys though. So if you happen to get stuck and can't get to the true ending, I almost guarantee that unless you just happen to luck upon that shard you're going to be looking through a walkthrough. And that's just not very good game design. Um, but that being said, I like I said, I still enjoyed my time with Bloodstained Ritual and Night. Even though it has its performance issues, for example, the art style is fantastic. I think the game looks excellent. Uh, the music is phenomenal. I mean, this is some really good stuff. If you like the Vania-type music, you are going to dig this. I guarantee it. 
Um, and there's some pretty cool challenges and boss fights. You know, there really is a lot to offer on this game. But I just think that there could have been more. You know, there could have been more given to us, and there wasn't. Um, so overall, you know, if I had to give this game a score, I'd probably say it's about an 8 out of 10. You know, I know it sounds kind of weird that I'm rating it that high because of how much negativity I've pressed on it. But it's still a really well-polished game. And, of course, the video feed is ended. So, thanks for watching. Until then, Down Phoenix out.